Amen. You okay? All right, good. Well, my name is Mark, and uh, I think Pastor Matt uh, didn't want to introduce me because he, he, my title is so difficult to go through. I think that's exactly what it was. And you're like, assistant district superintendent of something over whatever, something else, and something, yeah, so. But I am, uh, my name is Mark Lewis. I am the assistant district, dis- oh, now I can't even say it. I'm just some guy from Langley. <laughs> You, if you didn't know this, you belong to a wonderful, wonderful church that is part of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, and I am one of the folks that help shepherd a lot of our churches and our pastors in this district. Uh, I've been in ministry for over 30 years, the last three working in our district, and I get the wonderful, wonderful privilege of being able to come and minister and share with your pastor and your team here and many of our churches. We have 215 churches in the province of British Columbia and Yukon, and uh, my my job specifically is to travel to those churches and to encourage them, see them become hopefully healthier, more vibrant, outwardly focused churches reaching into their community. And so yesterday I was invited by Pastor Mike and Pastor Matt to come and be a part of your refresh day. And it was, as you heard already so much this morning, it was an awesome day. It was an awesome day. It was a great day. There was lots of fun, lots of, man, you guys know how to eat here in Kamloops. I, it was like, I, what, was the, what was the pasta? Pete's. Pete's pasta? Bah, that's good. Pete needs to expand to the lower mainland where I'm from because that was fantastic. We ate, we sang, the worship team. Can I, I want to stop and just tell you this. In my travels, I go to many, many, many churches. That are, most of the time there are smaller churches. Churches under 100 and things like that, 150 and down. And I can, and we, is this being recorded? All right, you might have to edit this part because I could lose my job if I say this, but your worship team is one of, if not the best worship team. In it. <laughs> so to the other 214 churches that just heard that, omit that, delete that, but it's like, but you guys, you guys are blessed with a great worship team. They did a fabulous, a fabulous job yesterday. Brandon, awesome. Wanda. Sorry, Kim had a sticker on yesterday, one of those like my name is, and it was Wanda. And so it was kind of the, I don't know, it was like worship Wanda or something. I don't know what it was. So you got a great team, great team, awesome, rock, fabulous, rock star voice, love that guy. Anyway, it was a great, great day, and I'm privileged to be able to come and share with you uh, a little bit this morning as well. Um, One of the things that I do when I travel to those churches is, again, I I really try to bring things back to a place of simplicity. Um, it's been a difficult couple years, and you said that, and it's been mentioned. It's been that way throughout our province in many of our churches. It's been hard. Uh, our churches have struggled with highs and lows and tensions and divisions and difficulties. And as I travel now and visit many of our pastors and many of our churches, one of the things that I really try to encourage them is to come back to a place as a church family of truly living out the great commandment, loving God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and as a church moving forward in the Great Commission, which is, to, uh, which is the challenge, it's, just, it's the mission statement for all of us to be able to be people and a church and a church family that reaches out and makes disciples in our community. Amen? And, and, and you know, it, it seems like that's so simple, those two things, the Great Commandment and the Great Commission, and yet somehow in the convoluted and difficultness of the, even the last two years, we have focused on many other things and forgot about those two things. And yet, and so when I get the opportunity to come and share, I wanna, I wanna bring our focus back to what those two things are. That is our calling, that is our challenge, that is our mission and our vision, to love God so passionately and to see that other people get to experience that love as well. But for a lot of folks, as we walk through this journey, um, those concepts are easy to grab a hold of. Yeah, we should love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and we should make disciples and see people come to Jesus. But the difficult thing is often, how do we do that? What's the process in which we do that? And I, I love to bring back people to way back into Matthew chapter four where I think there's another great calling, a great invitation where Jesus says, come and follow me. And that come and follow me is this challenge that says as you grow and mature and walk in your spiritual journey with Jesus to to be like him, to sound like him, to look like him, to, well, maybe not look like him. Some of us don't have hair. That'll never happen. So, But to, to act like him and to represent him in our community and our culture. 
And so this morning, I, I, wanna, I wanna challenge you with this great invitation to how do we be more like Jesus? How does our life reflect him? How does it, what does it look like in everyday life and particularly in this church family setting? I mentioned to the group yesterday that um, I pastored in, in a number of churches here in British Columbia and in Saskatchewan, but uh, an interesting turn of events in my life happened a number of years ago and I had the opportunity to pastor in Las Vegas, Nevada. And so for 13 years, we were down in Las Vegas. What an interesting place to be a pastor. I, man, we don't have enough time today because we'd need a whole bunch of breaks. I could share with you some incredible stories of what a crazy, wild place that is. And, and you know, when we were packing up our family to go, we were so excited about going to this city to do ministry, to the church we were going to, and to the ministry opportunity that we had. But... My, my family didn't share as much of the joy and excitement as I did about ministry. They were more excited about outlet malls in Las Vegas. <laughs> and my family, I discovered, and I really, it was weird. I, I mean, I, I'm married, to, I have a wonderful wife. Her name is Carrie. I have two children. They're adults now, Canyon and Esther. But when we went down, they were just little kids. And they were so excited about getting to Las Vegas so they could go shopping to the outlet malls. So we were there, we unpacked, we unloaded, and within that first week, my kids and my wife were just like, you know, boxes were everywhere, and they were just like, let's go to the outlet mall, let's go to the outlet mall, ah! And there was this like, okay, to make it better, let's go to the outlet mall. And we were blown away. We found this mall on the outside of town that was absolutely massive. Now, maybe some of you here today, do we have any shoppers here today, people who love shopping? Like three ladies. I Okay, you know what, though? We got to start this right here. We need to be honest. Men, you're sitting there looking at me. You are shoppers, I know. It just, it's about the store. If I said, how many love Cabela's? There'd be a few more hands, all right? There'd be a little more honesty, all right? How many love to go, like, shop for guns at Walmart? Okay. All right. So let's be honest, a whole lot of you love shopping. So you've been probably through this. We got there to the mall and we, we parked and it was like way out in the far end of a parking lot. It took us like 15 minutes to get to the front doors in 115 degree heat. And when we got inside, we were like, my kids were just bouncing. I want to go to the Mac store and I want to go to the Nike store and I want to go to Build-A-Bear and everything else. There was all sorts of excitement. And we stopped for just a moment, and, and we did what every typical family does when they get to the mall for the very first time. We didn't know where we were or what was going on. So we went and we looked for the big mall map, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? Those Usually sometimes they're video ones, but it's like a, the, the, the architectural map of the mall, and it's all color-coded, and there's numbers everywhere. And you go down the list because you want to know, is this mall have the stores that I want to go in? And so we were looking for Build-A-Bear and Nike and the Mac store and all these things. Yeah, oh, there it is. Look at that. There's the Mac store. Number 13,700 and whatever in the orange section on level three. So we look at the map and it's like, oh, oh boom. 13,700 and whatever on orange level three. So we found it and we know, excellent. That's where we want to get to. But what's the next thing you do? Shoppers. Well, that would be good too. But you first gotta start with, where are we, right? And we look for that little gray sticker that's usually the you are here sticker, right? You know what I'm talking about? It's usually worn off because people all touch it. Everybody wants to touch the you are here sticker. And it's like, okay, so there's where we wanna go, but now we know we're here. Oh, we're on west entrance number seven by whatever road. And then you start to map out, how do I get to where I wanna go? We gotta go down the elevator or the escalator. We gotta turn right around the ice rink and then we gotta go past the three fountains. And then there's a Ferris wheel and we go around the Ferris wheel and then we do, and boom, we get to orange level three. Going to the mall, we have no problem following those directions and doing that. Most of us do that exact same thing. But when it comes to that pathway of getting to accomplish our goals of living out our life Jesus, like Jesus, we often wanna do it on our own. We think we all have the best way and the best system and we figure that we know better than anybody else. And yet the truth is that Jesus has laid out for us, God has given us maps and plans and guidance to follow so that we accomplish and get to where we want to get or supposed to be the right way, amen? And I believe that one of the simplest and best guidelines of going from where we are right now to where we need to be is found in Philippians chapter two. So if you have your Bibles or your phones, 
tablets, whatever you got. We might even have it up on the, oh, we do have it up on the back screen. Excellent. Philippians chapter 2, Paul gives us, I think, a very simple, very black and white, very straightforward guideline of how to be more Christ-like. Sometimes, actually, we read through some of these verses and they seem so simple that they can just kind of fly in our eyes and, and out the back of our heads and we actually don't live them out. But I want to challenge you this morning as we're looking at these very simple guidelines to take them to heart very seriously and to listen how impassioned and how emboldened Paul is as he shares and says, this is the way for you and I to live like Jesus. This is the way for you and I to be an example to the world around us. Yes, love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, but follow these guidelines to do that. Let's have a look at what it says. We're gonna read, there's a lot of verses here from one to 15, but let's, let's read it together. Chapter two starts with this way. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Is there any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others, but be humble, thinking of yourself as better than yourselves, others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. That though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to, but instead he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and he was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and he died a criminal's death on a cross. And we'll jump down to verse 12 here. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it is even more important that you work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear, for God is working in you, giving you desire and power to do what pleases him. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Those are powerful words. And there is so much rich, wonderful lessons to be learned from those verses. I wanna today just look at three very unique things that Paul pours out his heart and says, this is how you need to live. These are the things you need to focus on to be people that are Christ-like. The very first one is this. He pours out his heart in the beginning with a very pastoral kind of plea and says, please, if you would make me happy, I've been the ones that planted your church, I've been the one that have poured into you people, I've helped, helped you grow, I've taught you, I, I've done all that I can, so please make me happy. Can you, number one, bring unity and not division? It, it's interesting to me that Paul starts with this because it's like even back in New Testament times, he recognized that people have faults and problems and that we're gonna bicker and we're gonna argue and we're gonna battle with each other over all sorts of things. And he recognized that as he was addressing this church in Philippi. And it's like, sadly, not much has changed since then till now. The reality today is, and we have seen this over the last couple of years, how badly hurt, wounded, and divided the church really is. Church should be a place where you can come and talk about hope and freedom. The church is supposed to be a place where you walk in the doors and you feel just the sense of God's presence and people who are exemplifying love and care and unity. But the truth is, especially over the last few years, we've walked into church and we've seen anything but that at times. And people are hurt and people are wounded. Instead of talking about hope, you walk in the doors and you're challenged with what political party do you support? The conversations around the coffee room or in the lobby are about do you agree with this opinion or my opinion or this issue? 
How do you feel about vaccines or masks or gender issues? And believe me, I'm not taking a side or a stance on this at all. I'm just pointing out the fact that particularly over the last few years, the enemy has tried to divide us, to weaken us, to chip away at us and bring up just disunity in our midst. And yet Paul challenges us and says, the truth is, if you want to live like Jesus, the priority for each and every one of us, then we need to be people who bring unity and not division. Verse two, he pours it out and says, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, working together with one mind and one purpose. What a beautiful example of the body of Christ. But honestly, can we truly say that we see that all the time? If we're going to live like Jesus, we must unite people around biblical truth and not divide them on social issues. Okay, wait a minute now. Yesterday, <clears throat> we had to have a talk about this. I'm still, it's still rubbing off on me a little bit, but down in the States for 13 years, there was a lot more, amen, preach, yes, go, woo! So when we get some powerful statements like that coming from God's word, we need to kind of be a little more awake there and bring that kind of unity. So we're gonna try that again with a yeah or a preach or a come on. I like that one, let's do that one. Pastor Mike, give me a come on. Let's, hey, did, did, you should have hired Michelle. Mike, I'm still debating, I love the guy, but like Michelle, that's gold right there. But listen, this is a truth, and I, and I want us to believe this and get our heads around it. If we're gonna live like Jesus, we need to unite people around biblical truth and not divide them on social issues. Yeah. Amen. Come on, there we go. Woo, I'm just, mm, 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 yeah. All right, calm down, I'm in Kamloops. Woo. It seems that as a church though, and, and I wanna be as serious about this as, as I can, is that we have become stubborn and, and intolerant and unwilling to forgive at times. And that was exemplified through the last few years. It was so difficult. But what should set us apart as followers of Christ is our ability to be loving, understanding, and unifying. Paul points out that this isn't a social issue or a political issue or a relationship issue. This is a heart issue. And if in our hearts we're easily offended or unwilling to forgive or holding a grudge, all this does is lead to disunity. And what kind of example of Jesus to the world is that? When we read through the New Testament, and we look at, at Jesus' ministry and how he taught and how he loved and how he cared for people, how he walked through cities and towns and interacted, we see two incredible character traits that stand out. The first one is this. You always see that Jesus thought of others, not himself, in every situation. Philippians 5 and 6 that we just read through says that you must have the same attitude that Christ had. For though he was God, he didn't think of quality with God as something to cling to. This is the king of the universe. This is the, the creator of the whole world and each and every one of us, the son of God. And yet never do we see him lording that over people. When he stood by the woman at the well, he talked to her, he loved her, he cared for her, he shared compassion with her. Her needs to drink and to talk and share came first before he ever brought up that she was a sinner. He didn't use his status to have people follow him, but instead he put others' needs ahead of his own. The second thing we see, and we actually talked a little bit about this yesterday, was that in his whole life and his whole ministry, it was all about sacrifice. Stepping back and putting his wants and his desires behind us so that people could be ministered to. He sacrificed himself. We looked at a verse yesterday in John chapter 18, one of the darkest and gloomiest kind of verses in the whole New Testament. The, the moment when Jesus is betrayed and arrested and people with torches and swords and weapons came to arrest him and they're, they're hunting him down. And as you're reading it, we, we recognize that this is the, the end of Jesus' ministry just about to happen. 
And in that uh, sad and dark moment, yet we still see this incredible attitude of sacrifice that Jesus does because it says this in verse four of chapter 18 in John, Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him and he stepped forward to meet his accusers. There was a willingness to sacrifice his life. When Jesus was about to be arrested in that moment, never more in the whole New Testament do we see a better example of sacrifice. He was about to be put on trial, about to be crucified. He didn't run, he didn't argue, he didn't declare that he was God, but rather he sacrificed himself in that moment for those he loved and in turn for you and I. He knew his hands his feet would be pierced with nails. He knew that the slapping of his face and the spitting on him and the beard pulling that would happen as he pulled that cross through the city streets would go on. He knew everything that was going to happen and yet he still sacrificed for us. His thoughts were of others, forgiving them and loving them. Can I tell you this morning that following Jesus, living like Jesus means that everything we do needs to bring togetherness, forgiveness, and unity. And you know what? Even if it costs us. Even if in the lobby you have to walk away from that argument that you know you could win. <laughs> even if you need to hold back that last harsh word that would just be a zinger, you do it. And even if you save that difference of opinion to a later time, or never at all, because what you wanna do is forgive and love and bring unity to a broken and fragmented culture, amen? The second thing we see, the second challenge that Paul gives us, and, and I want you to notice a little bit of a tone difference here. He starts out being very pastoral. Bring unity and not division. But I sense here as we start to read through, he's getting a little frustrated with people. So the next thing he says to us, he comes out and he just throws it right at us and said, you know what, be humble. And it's interesting that Paul goes right from this unity to humility, unity to humility. And what we realize here is that he recognizes that the key ingredient to a harmonious relationship with people is that somebody needs to be humble. Because a lot of times when we come into a partnership or a relationship or a friendship, two arrogant, cocky, know-everything people are just going to bash heads. And so Paul recognizes and says, hey, what you need to do as a Christ follower is be humble. Verses 3 and 4, he challenges us and says, don't be selfish. Don't try and impress others with all your knowledge and your wisdom all the time. But be humble, thinking of others as better than you. Now, that is such a simple concept, but it is hard to do. There's a unique connection as you read through the Old and New Testament between godliness and humility. And the more you study the Bible and the more you dive into it and grow in it, you'll start to see that over and over through both New and Old Testament, there is this representation that says, if you want to be a godly person, if you want your life to be exemplified by honor and respect and reverence to God, then you start with humility. Proverbs 3, verse 5 says this. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. It's a reminder that you don't know everything, but God does. You move on into the New Testament in Matthew chapter 11, 29. It says this, take my yoke upon you and let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. The more we want to be like Christ, the more we need to learn this kind of attitude. Proverbs 22 verse 4 sums it up in a very simple but powerful verse. It says, humility is the fear of the Lord. If you fear the Lord, if you honor the Lord, if you love the Lord, your life will be exemplified by humility. Truly being humble is seeing ourselves as we actually are. We are flawed, we are broken, we are helpless and in desperate need of a savior. And that's why God brings us to the foot of the cross and says, you need to be humble. One of the things that I love about God's word, a lot of people look at this and they think this is this book of rules and regulations and things that just hold you back from living life abundantly. And nothing could be further from the truth. It is a book filled with promises and truths to guide you through life so that you can live life abundantly. 
And as you read it and as you study it, you will learn that every time God puts something in front of it and says, you need to be this way, there's always a part two. You need to act this way, live this way, talk this way, and you will this. And in this particular situation, we're talking about humility. God's promise comes to us way back in the Old Testament. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, it says this. I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts. So if you're a person who has a humble, broken spirit and you walk in humility, God will bless you. Do this, get that. Who doesn't want to be blessed by God today? No, a little more on that. Come on. That's the beauty of it. God giving us guidelines, a pathway to get to the ultimate goal. And he says, look it, be humble and I will bless you. But it means that everything that we do in life, our feelings, our preferences, our opinions, take a second place to what God wants for us and how he wants us to live. That kind of humility moves this church forward and brings life to this church family. The third thing Paul challenges us with, and again, the tone is changing a little bit here. Bring unity, not division. Hey, be humble. And now he just comes right out. Stop complaining and arguing. I mean, I think it's interesting. I, I would have loved to see what the New Testament church looked like, but obviously it's probably, we're just like a mirror of it today. This was going on back then. Paul stood back and looked at this church that he had planted and poured his life into, and people were complaining, and people were arguing about every little thing. Now, now we walk in and we complain about like, oh, wow, my latte's a little cold. <laughs> I mean, I'm, obviously that didn't happen in the New Testament, you know? Or it's like, do these seats need to be this close together? Like, Really? Come on, Pastor Matt. Can Pastor Mike say anything, or does Michelle always have to do it? I mean, really. I'm just kidding. Mike, you know I love you. Yeah! There we go! But I, I, I think Paul recognized that this was a flaw that we have as humans, that we're just prone to, no matter what God has done for us, complain. And here he says, look at in verse 14, and I look at the wording here. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Not some things, not most things, everything. I mean, he completely rules it out. If you want to be living your life that's Christ-like, then you don't complain about anything. You don't complain about the guy that cut you off turning into the parking lot. Oh, bless you. you. You don't complain about, Dina, the coffee is fabulous. No one should ever complain about the coffee in the back there. But it's, yeah, go ahead, give Dina a big hand, yeah. But it's just this challenge to us to recognize that if you're gonna be this example of who Christ is, we live lives that are positive. It is about attitude. The attitude that you bring to every situation, it's an opportunity to reflect the love of Jesus to the world. Now the truth is this morning, this comes naturally to us. I mean, this was a problem back in the Old Testament, right? I mean, look at one of the greatest stories of complaining, I think, in the whole Bible, is when you look at the, the children of Israel and you go back in their time in the wilderness. I mean, here, this whole group of Israelite people were just freed from Pharaoh's tyranny and slavery. They were in bondage for years and God brought them into freedom. I mean, he, he saved them. He did amazing miracles for them, delivering them from slavery and from Pharaoh's grasp. He parted the sea. He provided for their every need. And as you read through that story, all of a sudden you see the moment they're out in the wilderness, they start to complain and murmur and whine and grumble. You would think that we would have looked at that and learned something today. But we still complain. God sent his son to die for you and I and we still find ways to complain. He forgives all our sins and our mistakes, and we still complain. He gives us his Holy Spirit to help guide us, empower us, and enrich our lives, and we still complain. He gives us a new purpose and new direction in life. He hears and answers our prayers, and we still complain. If we want to live our lives as witnesses of who Jesus is, stop complaining. 
Paul wraps up this wonderful 15 verses of teaching. And actually, does the worship team come back at the end of your service? Come on back. Kim, Brandon, come on back. I get, can I, I get the feeling like I get to do anything I want today. This is great. This doesn't normally happen to me. Free coffee for everybody after. No, just kidding. Just kidding. That's not going to happen. Sorry, Dina. You looked very stressed there when I said that. But yeah, Kim, could you just play for me a little bit there? You guys, come on back up. And I love how Paul takes this whole section and he, and he wraps it up. Very practical teaching, very simple teaching, but so powerful. And he comes back and he says, yes, to live a Christ-like life, to follow this pathway. Stop complaining. Be humble. Bring unity wherever you go. But in verse 15, he challenges us and he says, live clean and innocent lives as children of God. Shining like bright lights in a world of crooked and perverse people. I'm not sure what the world in New Testament times was like, but I know that our world is a broken, crooked, perverse, devastated world. There's injustice and sin and frailty and weakness everywhere. And the calling that we have to be Christ followers is to live so that the world sees us in a different way than everything else that's around them. So he says, shine like bright lights. Basically he's saying, shine like stars in the darkness. In the midst of a dark sky, let people recognize and notice that you are different. Not by just what you say, but by every interaction you have in the workplace at the stores that you visit, on the campuses that you go to, and particularly more than any other place here in this building when you gather together. Shine like stars so that the world sees it's different. Paul reminds us that you and I have to live in this broken world, but we are not of it. We are children of God set apart and called to be different. Not different in a way that lords it over our world, but different in a way that lets the world see what the best way to live life is as a child of God, forgiven, humble, and broken in his midst. This world needs Jesus. And you and I can play a role in that by putting our life on display. You and I can be beacons that point people to Jesus. The great invitation to follow him is to live like him so that the world sees a difference. Can I pray with you this morning? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, for its promises and its truths. And at times, its challenges to us, that stretch us, that make us uncomfortable because it's pulling us to a place that sometimes we find difficult to go to. But we know today, Lord, when we read your word and we look at Paul's challenges that you want us not to stay where we are, but to continually be growing and maturing and evolving as better, deeper, greater followers of Jesus. And to do that sometimes, Lord, we have to come back to some basics and remember who it is we represent and remember who it is we live for. Remember who sacrificed everything for us. And so it's our honor and it's our privilege to try to live this way, to bring harmony and grace and love in every relationship, to find that place of unity that we can grow together, to remember how important it is that we put the needs of others above our wants and desires and preferences. And oh Jesus, let us with every ounce of our being come to the place where we don't look for things to complain about or start arguments about, but rather where we look and see areas that we can pour our lives into of love and of acceptance and of grace and forgiveness so that together as a church family, we can show the world a difference. We can show people Jesus. Give us the boldness and the courage to do that, I pray today. In your amazing name, Lord.